Central Baptist Church welcomes you to the Central Message. Over the next few minutes, you're going to experience worship and preaching unlike the traditional and beyond the ordinary. Hello, I'm Ron Phillips. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Come join our spiritual family as we worship in the freedom only Christ can give. And now, from the Central Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Central Message. I'm standing here amidst the ruins of Beit Shan, and the theme of our trip to Israel this year is remember. It was here on this wall, this great tell of this city, where the body of the wicked and rebellious King Saul, when he turned against God and died, was hung. This was one of the cities of the Decapolis, a beautiful Roman city. Perhaps Jesus himself visited this city. We're not sure, but we know he visited this region. But in the 8th century B.C., an earthquake fell this city, and it's only been recently recovered in the last several years. So we're standing here remembering what used to be, and the God who spoke then is still alive today, and what he says today is still as valid. You and I need to understand that what we have on this earth, no matter how magnificent, is temporary. And so we need to be remembering that God Almighty's word is the truth and that nothing can ever take its place. Walk with us through Israel and remember his truth. I'm standing here on what may be the ruin of one of the cities of the plain in fact, I may be standing where once the city of Sodom stood. We have looked around this area. We've been inside a cave over here where we've seen what could be an archway. We've seen walls. And I'm standing right by, right now, a piece of crystallized stone. It have only been caused by extreme heat. All around us, we see remnants and evidences of what could have been a city. But you need to understand that God didn't promise to leave any recognizable ruins. In, in the book of 2 Peter, God said that he turned these cities to ashes as an example for those who would be alive in the last day. What's left for us are the ashes or the remnants of what fire and judgment has caused uh, in these cities. There's been recently in Charisma Magazine an article about the exploration of these areas and the cities of the plain. And I believe that these things are coming to light again in the last days. In fact, the interest in the Holy Land is alive again because people believe that Jesus Christ could be coming back very soon. I believe I'm standing here today where the very stones are crying out, Jesus Christ could come back. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And you'll remember how it was in the days of Lot. The 16th chapter of Ezekiel says, these be the sins of Sodom, pride, abundance of bread, a loving idleness, and they did not strengthen the hand of the poor. And God said, they committed abomination before me. You'll remember that scene over in the book of Genesis where the, the very angel of the Lord came to the city and tried to plead with Lot to bring his family out of that accursed place. God had seen the evil there. And you'll remember a band of homosexuals gathered around and begged Lot to send the men out that they might rape them. And Lot was so perverse at this point in his life that he offered his own daughters and they wouldn't take them. And finally, the angels of the Lord struck those perverse people blind. And God told them, get out of this city. Tomorrow I'm going to destroy it. Now you think about this area. When Lot chose it, it was the most beautiful part of the land. It doesn't surprise me as the Dead Sea has been receding that they're finding springs coming up out of the water. For this used to be the well-watered plain of the Jordan. But after the judgment of God... We have now, instead of a living lake, instead of a beautiful river flowing into the Aqaba Gulf, we now have before us a dead sea. Evidence here on the lowest point of the earth of the judgment of Almighty God. Folks, I'm standing here, not in the middle of a myth, but in the middle of a reality. And as we think about remembering, in Luke chapter 17 and verse 32, there is an ominous warning. 
three words from the mouth of Jesus after he had said, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. This ominous warning. He said it in three words. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Can you imagine what it was like on that day? Probably business as usual in the large city of Sodom. Streets filled with businessmen hustling to make a living. It was a day like all of the days before. Mrs. Lot was preparing the breakfast for the children. Lot, who I believe was mayor of the city of Sodom, because he sat at the gate. He was at least a judge or a political, city, a political official was there. In the city, young and old were untangling themselves from another night in the clubs, a, a night of sin and a night of vice. No one knew that they would not live another 24 hours. No one knew what was about to happen. But suddenly the patience of God ran out. And there began to fall from heaven not rain. Some thought it was hailstone. But suddenly they realized that it was brimstone. If you look up brimstone in the dictionary, it, it's sulfur. And there's been found, in fact, you can smell the sulfur all over this area. They have found recently little balls, and when they break them open, there's red sulfur on the inside of them. They can't find that kind of sulfur anywhere on the face of the earth. When it burns, if you have it in a even stainless steel, it will burn a hole in it. It's that hot. That's what fell on this area. And those who had been enjoying a day as usual, all of a sudden, God's patience ran out and God's wrath fell upon the cities of the plain. As I ride along here and as I look around me, I think about the thousands upon thousands of people that lived here that on one moment, suddenly, their lives were changed forever. And I think about Lot himself, don't you? The Bible says we'll see Lot in heaven. Think about it. But his wife's in hell. Think about Lot being a man who sat in the gate, a man of influence. But to our knowledge, not one person in the city ever had their life changed because of the testimony of Lot. In fact, the Bible says his righteous soul was vexed. That means absolutely controlled by the filthy behavior of the wicked. He, instead of changing his environment, his environment changed him. Oh, what a sad moment. But I think of all the characters in this story. The saddest one of all is Lot's wife. And we're told Jesus said to remember her. Now, you say, why should we remember her? Jesus said so, amen? That's good enough reason for me. If Jesus said I need to remember someone, I want to remember them. There's another woman we've been told to remember in the Bible. Do you remember the woman who loved Jesus? and who, who wept tears and broke her alabaster box. And Jesus said, she's going to be remembered. She's going to be remembered wherever this gospel is preached. That woman's in heaven. But here's another woman who's in hell. And Jesus said she would be remembered. And I stand here on what may be the ruin of the city of Sodom today to declare to you that we're obeying the Lord Jesus and we are remembering this woman. I want you to remember several things. Number one, I want you to remember she was a woman of privilege. She had known God's witness. We know she lived for at least five years with Abraham. Abraham who offered Isaac. Abraham who was the father of many nations. Abraham who is the father of the faithful. Abraham who was the friend of God. Abraham who had a witness of faith. She knew him. He was her father-in-law. She had heard the Lord's witness through him. She had heard God's word through him. She had had opportunity to, to be around people and see the very miracles of Almighty God. She had seen the choice Abraham made to leave uh, Ur of the Chaldees and to come to this place. She had also seen God's, had heard God's warning. We don't know who the strange visitors were to Lot. But many scholars believe it was the pre-incarnate Christ himself. Think about that. The angel of the Lord, singular, in capital letters, many believe, is a, is a representation of the pre-incarnate Christ. As a matter of fact, when Abraham entertained these strangers that came, 
He called them Lord. Am I right? He called them Lord. And so, in her own house, she had angelic visitors at the very minimum, and maybe the Lord Jesus himself before he became incarnate in this world. They were there in her home. They sat at her table. They said tomorrow this city is going to be destroyed. They warned her. She heard it. She had the great privilege of hearing the truth from this woman, from this man of God. This woman, there's not another woman on the face of the earth that ought to have gone to heaven like this woman should have. There's not another woman in the Old Testament that had the privilege of walking with Abraham. Her husband was even a believer. Lot, we know, his righteous soul, as I've said, was vexed by the filthy behavior of the wicked. We know that she had these privileges before her. As I said, any woman who had lived in that kind of environment should have known God. But what good did these privileges do? In spite of all of them, she lived a godless life, impenitent and unbelieving. She had a cloak of religious profession, uh, just like her husband. But inside, she had never really been saved. You see, you can be religious and not know the Lord. And many who are watching this television program, you're religious, but you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. You go to some church or you've been through some ritual or you accommodate your husband or your wife just so they won't nag you to go. That's the way this woman was. Her, I can hear a lot now saying it's time for us to worship Jehovah. Oh, yeah, 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 we'll get to that. We're going to keep the feast. Oh, okay, we're going to do that. But somehow it never registered. Not the faith of Abraham, not the faith of her husband, Nothing ever registered in this woman's life. I could go through and name uh, many people in the Bible who had the opportunity to live in a, in a privileged position. But if I was going to name one, I'd name Judas Iscariot. Can you imagine walking with Jesus and walking with the disciples and yet committing suicide and going to hell after living three years in the very present of Jesus Christ. My friend, this woman was a woman of privilege, and every one of you are too. All of us have the privilege of what a billion people on earth never have heard, and that's to hear the sweet name of Jesus and know that we can be saved. See, you can have a Christian companion. You can enjoy Christian preaching. You can, you can like Christian people. You can live a life of acceptable morals. You can be close to the kingdom but you can die in a state of darkness and die lost. You remember what happened that day? God came and said, now for whatever you do, don't look back. Don't look back. That brings me to the second thing I want you to remember. Not only her privilege, but remember her perversity. She disobeyed God's word. I mean, when God says don't look back, don't look back. But I want to take just a moment to, to, to say some things. Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looketh back is fit for the kingdom of God. There's something about going on with God in the Bible that we all must understand. When God says it's time to move from where you are to another place, you better get on down the road. When God says it's time to change, it's time to change. And God spoke to this woman and he said, Get out of there. There's going to be a new life for you. And I don't want you to even look back at what the past had. Don't look back at what's behind you. But she looked back. And it was a look of disobedience. I mean, she absolutely looked back in, in the face of all that God had told her to do. I tell you, folks, if you want to know what the greatest problem of the day we have in the world as far as morals, it's disobedience to God. It's just simple disobedience to God. The greatest problem in the church today is that we won't do what God's told us to do. And I'm standing here, my friend, on visible evidence that when God says to do something, you better get on down the road. There's some of you listening to me right now, watching by television, and God's given you an opportunity to come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you never have. He's given you signs. He's given you opportunity. He's pulled and tugged at your heart. But you preferred your own way. 
had a person tell me the other day, he said, well, Brother Ron, why, why do you think people go to hell? He said, of course, the obvious thing is they don't believe in Jesus. But I'm going to tell you why people go to hell. It's because they don't want to give up their sin. They don't want to give up their lifestyle. And Lot was wealthy. Lot was positioned. Lot was high in society. Lot was privileged. We believe they probably had a large home, probably what we'd call a villa today. They had everything possible. And everything she lived for was, was invested in the city of Sodom. And you can see, my friend, what was left of her investment. And some of you, you live for your home or your car or your possessions or the things that you have. And I'm telling you, there's not anything that, that, that around you that's going to live forever but the spirit that lives inside of that body of yours. Not even the body you're living in is going to survive. You're going to have to have a resurrection body. You have an ever-living, never-dying soul. It's going to go on forever. But around you, the things that you count as important are temporary. They're not going to be here. I'm standing here, as I said, in the middle of an area that was once a thriving community of more than one city with beautiful streams and rivers and villas and houses and business and population. But today, it's desolate. Today, it's a ruin. Today, all around us is destruction. She was a woman of privilege, but she was also a woman of perversity. God said, don't look back, but she looked back. See, her, her body was out of Sodom, <laughs> but her heart was still there. See, we can get your body out of Egypt, but we've got to get Egypt out of you. It's one thing to be in the church. It's another thing for God to be in your life and for your life to be changed. Her heart was set on the world. The Bible says that we're not to set our affections on the things of the world, but we're to set our affections on things above, things that are eternal, things that God has provided for us. Well, I need to look at the third thing. Sadly, we must remember her punishment. I don't know about those of you who are standing here with me on this Holy Land trip, but when I stand here and think about the, the, the souls that, that, that died here, my mind leaps ahead to that day when every human being will have to give an account to God. I want to talk about her punishment. First of all, her punishment was sudden. It was fast. You know, she didn't know that that, that day she got up the last day that she'd ever live on the face of the earth. And the Bible says to you, my friend, boast not yourself of tomorrow. You know not what a day may bring forth. The Bible says our life is like a weaver shuttle. It's that quick. James said, what is your life? It's but a vapor, a, a wisp or a cloud that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. The Scripture says, behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The Scripture says in Hebrews 3, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. What happened to Lot's wife was sudden. Fast. I mean, she was fleeing that city, and all of a sudden she thought, boy, I just want to look back one time. God said, don't look back. She said, I'm just going to look back one time. She turned around, and when she looked back, she was killed. She died, and her whole body was crystallized into salt. It's an irony to me that wh where I'm standing, I can look across the Dead Sea and see a pile of salt, that the, one of the largest salt factories in the world is here. God turned this whole area into salt. I don't know what chemical reactions took place. I don't know what fire fell from heaven. I don't know what burning and, 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 and eruptions were caused by what God did, but it left salt here. But it left a woman as well. It turned her in to a pillar of salt. I mean, suddenly, one moment she was alive. The next moment, her, everything about her was changed. She was dead. She was frozen. She was crystallized. She was as dead as a stone standing there. It was fast. I want to say secondly, it was fearful. It's terrible to die, but it's terrible to die without the Lord in your life. I've had the sad privilege before the day of Demerol and drugs that people die drugged now. 
of being at the bedside of lost people, trying to lead them to Christ, and hear them say that final no, and then hear their horrible scream. Many of you have heard Maurice Rawlings from Chattanooga's testimony of how he got saved. He was a nominal Presbyterian, but he was, he's a heart surgeon and a heart doctor. And one day in the emergency room, Park Ridge Hospital, they brought a man in who was clinically dead. But, but he began to, to do heart massage, and they began to shoot uh, the, the adrenaline into his heart, and they began the breathing. And the man came back for a moment. And as he came back, he began to scream, Don't let me go to hell! Don't let me go to hell! Don't let me go to hell! Dr. Rawlings began to work even harder. And the man awoke up again and he said, Tell me how to be saved! Tell me how to be saved! And Dr. Rawlings said, Even though I was a nominal Presbyterian, I knew enough that Jesus was the only Savior. And I said, Here you go, son. Pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Please come into my life and save me. Please come into my life and save me. That man was not only saved, he was healed. And Dr. Rawlings says, with a smile on his face today, I got caught on the same hook. While I was leading him to pray, I prayed the same prayer and invited Jesus Christ into my life as my Lord and Savior. He was a man who was dying, and he was afraid of going to hell. In fact, he testified that he, could, he sensed that he was drifting into a place of burning and a place of torment. I don't understand all about hell, but I know nobody has to go there. Nobody has to disobey God. Nobody has to live the life that's back there. There's a life in front of you by faith when you come to Jesus Christ. And your Lord Jesus Christ that died on the cross said, Remember Lot's wife. Her end came fearfully. Her end was fatal. She died, and the moment she died, it was over. And I want to say this about death. There's some of you watching me today who think that death is the end. There's nowhere in the Bible we're taught that death is the end of anything. The definition of death is separation. Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. Physical death is the separation of your spirit from your body. Everybody here say separation. The separation of your spirit from your body. That's death. But your spirit's still alive. Your body's dead, but your spirit's alive. Do you know that if you're not saved, you're spiritually dead? Because you know what the definition of spiritual death is? The separation of your spirit from God. If you're lost, you're spiritually dead. Now the Bible warns us about a second death. Anybody ever heard second death? I want to teach you some addition, something you can understand, something that's very simple. If you're without Jesus Christ right now, you are spiritually dead. Say one. If you die a physical death, then you're separated, your, your spirit is separated from your body and from God forever. Say, one plus one is two. Hear me. If you die physically while you're dead spiritually, you will experience the second death. That's what happened to Lot's wife. And that's why Jesus wanted us to remember her. It became just like that. And if you die without Jesus Christ, there's no hope for you after death. But you will live forever someplace. And the Bible teaches there's only heaven and hell. And the choice is yours right now, right where you are. You see, I want to say another thing. Her punishment was final. There was no reprieve. There's no escape. There was no appeal. There was no pardon. There was no hope. There was no way out of what she was doing. In the immortal poem Dante wrote called The Inferno about hell, there's a sign over the gate of hell. It says, Abandon all hope, all ye who enter in here. Abandon all hope, all ye who enter in here. Listen to me, friend. If you die without Christ, you, you move into a hopeless existence where life will never change. You'll never have another opportunity. You say, Brother Ron, why are you telling us this from the Holy Land? I'm standing here where the city of Sodom once stood and where life once thrived. I'm standing here giving evidence that God Almighty is not only a God of great love, He is a God of judgment and a God of justice. I'm standing here where stones and rocks have been burned until they turn to crystal. I'm standing here where you can barely make out in these ashes the remnants of what once was a city. I'm standing here 
where God warns you in the Bible in more than one occasion to remember Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said in the last days in 2 Peter and in the book of Jude that these ashes would rise out of the ground and truth is springing out of the earth as a testimony that you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. But he's also a God of great love, isn't he? Because I can stand here today and tell you he loves you. I can stand here and tell you you don't have to go to hell. I can stand here and tell you you don't have to face the judgment. I can stand here and tell you that if you'll give your heart and life to him, you won't have to go through this. He loves you so much, he's letting you watch this on television. He's letting you see this ruin where we stand. He's letting you experience this right now so that your life can change forevermore. And right where you are right now, you may be in a bar, you may be in a hotel room, you may be at home, you may have your family, you may be by yourself. But right now, right where you are, I want to invite you to ask Jesus into your life. Right now, bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. That's right. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying for me. I believe you're alive in hearing me pray. I believe you're alive in hearing me pray. Please come into my life and save me. Please come into my life and save me. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to write to me. I'm going to send you some material to help you get started right. God bless you, and may you receive his love and not his judgment by receiving his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for ordering from The Central Message. We hope this tape has encouraged you in your spiritual walk. To receive additional copies or for information on other resource materials available from The Central Message, write to Ron Phillips, P.O. Box 937, Hickson, Tennessee, 37343. Or give us a call at 1-800-877-6493. And be sure to visit us on the web. Our address is www.ronphillips.org. The Central Message is an international broadcast ministry of the Central Baptist Church of Hickson in Chattanooga, Tennessee.